to be perfectly honest, uh, I was quite unsure what uh, I would be talking about today when I was writing the call for a proposal. Uh, but I wanted to share my story of uh, basically turning a uh, hobby project of mine into something that is applicable in practice. And I'm sure you probably ask, like, who the hell is this guy and uh, should I even trust him? Uh, in a way, I'm, I was kind of a parasite in academia since like 2014. I was a PhD student, I was a mentor to many students, and I was also something that's called the postdoc. Basically, I did a research for money. It was quite nice, actually. And I'm hardly an exemplary researcher, so if you look at Scopus, which is like the database for the, for the scientists, uh, I have eight times more papers than Linus Torvalds. I have 26 times more citations than Linus Torvalds, and my H index, which is like the number that says how good you are, is four times bigger than Linus Torvalds. So probably I'm not actually that bad scientist. And I also have to make some disclaimers. I generated um, lots of uh, sea lion images using AI, so please bear with me. And also sometimes there are a lot of text, so either you can read the slides or simply you can you know, listen to what I said. And uh, finally, Please ask me after my talk, let me do my thing, and I will surely answer anything you want to know. I also want to start a little bit lighthearted to uh, highlight some differences between working in academia and working in practice. Now, if you are working in academia, there is no JIRA. Uh, there is hardly any project planning actually going. This It's more of an uncontrollable chaos. On the other hand, in practice, there are no unpaid reviewers. So there is nobody who will stomp on your like years of work because uh, you didn't uh, use the right words or uh, the reviewer didn't like the presentation or something like that. In academia, you don't need users. You only need the results. So you can do anything you want, some obscure theories. Uh, you don't need applications of your tools, just present some papers. And in practice, you usually don't need luck. You only need diligence. Work hard and you will rise in the rank. In academia, you have a freedom to pursue your dreams, your passions, anything you want. You have lots of freedom. And in practice, I realize that there is always somewhere in the building a free food, which is nice. Especially if you are a red hatter, I'm, I'm sure you know what happens um, on Tuesday, 2 o'clock, right? So in the next, I will be talking about my journey from an hobby project called the Perun, the performance under control, and how we actually try to apply it on kernel. Now, Perun, it's basically a performance tool suite that I started as a hobby project in 2016, and basically it, it was a platform for experimenting with different scopes of program performance, so like measuring the data, how, how fast your program is, how much uh, resources it consumes, uh, analyzing it, uh, detecting performance regressions, generating some time-consuming uh, uh, workloads, or maybe simply printing, uh, pretty printing the results. And also, the one particular aspect was that I decided that I would link the performance results to the functional changes. So basically, it was a wrapper over a git, maintaining the link between commits and results. And I was like, man, why, why, why nobody ever thought about such a good idea? I was sure that eventually Mark Zuckerberg or someone will, will write me and say, hey, we want to buy you for billions. Well, sadly, the world is really big and there are a lot of similar projects like Parks, uh, PerfRepo, which was developed in Red Hat actually, PerfCI, and so on. But still, uh, we were working with my students. We started quite low. It was just like toy projects of like, 1,000 lines of code, but we try to have some fun. So, for example, here you can see we did some uh, heap uh, map of a program that was manipulating either with single link list, so you can see those in magenta, or some continuous memory, which, which are uh, arrays and vectors. On the right, we, you can see some, um, some regression models for the skip list search list, uh, search algorithm, sorry. So as I said, we tried to have some fun, but it was like toy program. But as we got more mature, uh, we got more stable core, we got more students, and we could explore new horizons. 
So one of the things that we did is so-called the performance fast testing. If you, if you don't know fast testing, it's basically a loop, and each, in each iteration of the loop, you take the inputs of your program, you mute it at them, and you feed it back to your program, and you observe what happens. In performance fast testing, you observe how it relates to the resources. Uh, also, we, we try to profile the program, so we experimented with instrumentation frameworks such as eBPF or SystemTap, uh, or both of those uh, well embraced by Red Hat, and we also did some more complex performance modeling. We also got bigger and more ambitious. Oh, we actually evaluated our methods on text editors like gedit, vim, and many others, which has almost a half a million of lines of code. And the results were actually quite interesting. So for example, in the per uh, performance fast testing, we took some initial workload, it was like 18 bytes of characters, we mutated it to 36 bytes of character, uh, characters, and we made the, the input program run for more than five hours. So just a few small changes and we can generate a really huge workload that completely kills your program. And as for the profiling, well, we still weren't there, but uh, we were able to profile the Vim, generally like 200 megabytes of data in between uh, one minute and two hours, depending how much data we collected. Uh, as we got older and more um, adept at the profiling, together with my uh, colleague Girka Pavela, uh, we decided to do some proper research and we were trying to optimize the profiling process itself. Now the idea was that we didn't want to instrument like uninteresting functions, to throw them away and only profile like, the core of the program. And the motivation was to save the time, because time is money, and also the size of, of the generated data. And all of this while maintaining something called, the, let's call it a precision, but it basically means that you will still be able to analyze some interesting info based on these uh, performance profiles. Now, we were uh, mostly experimenting on CPython, and uh, we use PyPerformance Benchmark. If you don't know PyPerformance, it's a very extensive benchmark that in, uh, if you are profiling it, it runs for maybe even days. So it's quite ex ex extensive. And using just a lot, uh, let's say, light optimizations, we were able to save seven hours of, well, my time, but maybe even your time. And we can save 100 gigabytes of data which I think is actually quite impressive. Well, you, you think yourself whether you would like to save like 100 gigabytes of, of data on your computer. Uh, well, but in academy it's not so easy, so certain reviewer number two uh, was not impressed. So he basically said, uh, while saving space is helpful, it's unclear how big of a problem it is. So, and we got rejected, sadly. So I don't know, maybe we are not ambitious enough. And it took about seven years of diligent work with many students and we started uh, talking with Red Hat again, which was uh, supporting us for, for quite a lot of time. And we got talking with the uh, kernel performance team, mainly with Jirka Hlapky and his colleague Kamil Kolakowski. And we, we wanted to improve the root cause analysis of issues found directly in kernel. So in the next I will uh, show you some challenges that we have to face. Now, the first challenge is the profiling the kernel itself. So you can see this, this is me, the sea lion, we're uh, fighting the kernel, the big robot. Now, the good thing is that uh, we have eBPF now. You, you might have heard some presentations already or heard about eBPF. This is basically how you can uh, profile or instrument anything in the kernel. Uh, tomorrow, Viktor Malik will have a talk about how you can instrument everything in the kernel. However, we decided to do it a different way and we first run perf, which basically pre-collects what is being fired in like the input benchmark. Then based on the list of symbols, we create eBPF program, which is injected into the kernel. And whenever one of those sim symbols is fired, we communicate through some ring buffer and we generate performance profile. So it, it's a, a, quite a simple concept, some simple concept. 
So let's consider that uh, we generally like 200 megabytes of data and let's consider the kernel performance scheme. So they test like five kernels per week and they keep the results for two years. So it's uh, like 50 releases of the kernel, so there's like 100 gigabytes of data. They run about 15 benchmarks for each kernel, so that's like about terabyte of data. And usually you, you, you want to test more configurations, so for example, we experiment with, with uh, testing mitigations on and off or C Linux on and off, so we talk about terabytes of data. So I'm, I'm sure it's unclear how big of a problem it is, dear reviewer number two, so we probably should send him some swag soon. Uh, however, there are many different uh, challenges when uh, you want to profile kernel. And one of the things that we uh, find out quite quickly is that uh, some of the functions of interest are inline. So we presented the results and we couldn't find uh, the so-called maple tree functions because they are inline. So you have to profile the, directly the, the addresses where they are called, which is not so straightforward, or simply abandon profiling them at all. Also, we realized when we uh, instrumented a lot of the functions that uh, somehow the eBPF gets overloaded and it, it tries to, it basically throws away some of the events. So you have to use the so-called multi-probes which doesn't suffer from this, this particular problem. So instead of having like 100 probes for 100 functions, you have only one probe for 100 functions. And there are some other, other issues, like some calls are simply missing returns because there are optimizations, so there is tail call optimizations, there are uh, interrupts, there are some go-tos. So it's rather a pain in the A, you know, I, I won't swear, so uh, for parsing, then just, just an issue of uh, un unprofilability, yes, sorry. And uh, some functions are simply unprofilable and who knows why. I just know that sometimes I was profiling on one of our servers and suddenly my SSH connection died on, I had like three, three connections, all of them were completely dead and I have no idea why probably I instrumented something that I shouldn't. And actually there are some minor things like some benchmarks are multi-threaded so you have to mark that there is it's TID and not only a PID when measuring. So we get to the second, uh, in my opinion, much bigger challenge, and this is how to present the results. I just, I just want to remark that uh, the C line, it's not pointing in the pie chart, it's fighting it because nobody likes pie charts, yeah. Uh, we presented the preliminary results to our friends in Red Hat, and we realized that there are so many data that it's basically unreadable. So my advice to you, just generate some interactive tabular view, it's very fast. Uh, create some Jinja template, feed it your data, and then make a few calls to the data tables JS, and voila, you have a very nice interactive table that is searchable, that is orderable, and that can actually help you for some preliminary inspection of the data. Uh, however, you, you do not see any like immediate overview of the results, and uh, since we are doing performance analysis work for quite a time, we naturally know who Brendan Gregg is. Just, just a little um, uh, sidestep. Uh, who, who knows who Brendan Gregg is? Awesome. So if you know Brendan Gregg, I'm, I'm sure you know what, what is his flame graph.pl Perl script that generates the flame graphs. Now flame graphs are amazing in a way that you can immediately see the differences between two measured profiles. So here we have uh, data for one particular kernel. On the right side, we have the data for the same kernel with backport of the maple tree functions. And I highlighted the maple tree functions in magenta, and you can immediately see that they are called over here. So the wider the rectangle, the more time the, f the program spent in that particular function. So you immediately see there is something wrong over here. And also this, this tower is more like a baradur, and this uh, tower is more like a Minas Tirith. So you, you see visually that there are quite differences immediately. However, I personally miss that there is, there is no, nothing below. So I would like like combination of the flame graph and the so-called icicle graph. A nice thing is that there is a particular uh, type of graph called the Sankey graph, 
which is amazing because it shows you both the caller and callee. So again, we generate uh, using Jinja our uh, HTML site. We call Plotly, add a little bit of interactivity, and voila, we have a Sankey graph. However, remember, this is kernel. It's actually not so easy. So for example, this is one of the Sankey graphs that we generated. And basically, you can see nothing there. So it's very hard to make sense of anything. So on our fourth try, we create something where we blended all of this together, like ultimate report. So on the start, you, you are basically see the configurations that were used to measure the data, and you have highlighted the differences. Sorry, it's a little bit small, but on the left side, we have disabled the CE Linux, or C Linux, I don't know how it's pronounced in English, actually. Then, you usually want to see the quick overview. So you choose the metric, and you see two flame graphs. And you immediately see that there is, there is something wrong, you know. There, 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 there were called some C Linux functions that shouldn't be, because this is the same uh, test, but only with and without C Linux. And it shouldn't be called there at all. So you want to dive in, you click on the particular rectangle, and you get the Sankey graph. Uh, it's still quite a bonkers, you know. So uh, as I said, you need a little bit of interactivity. You can make some adjustment, and you, it's pretty, you can see the green is good, the red is bad, the, the blue is uh, probably okay, I guess. And you want to explore more of the complex, as I said, deep di dive down, and you expand it, and you see that there are some calls, like six seconds, that shouldn't be there immediately. And if you're a, a hardcore masochist or something, you can naturally go for our browse all mode when you have the interactive data tables with a lot of the in, in interactivity, uh, all of the uh, measured data and some traces. And that's like our ultimate visualization. So now we go into the third challenge, which is matching traces. So now I'm fighting like some trace monster. So the prompt for AI was like CLN fighting a trace monster or something like that. Uh, so naturally, if you are analyzing anything, you need something to compare uh, against. So you need to find like pairs of traces. I, by, by trace, I mean like sequence of calls to functions. And you, you need this either because you are manually inspecting them and you want to compare what was the previous state or you want to uh, run some automatic analysis and it needs to match it to say that there is some problem. And as I said, we are talking about kernel. So our experiments show that th there are so many traces in kernel, right? There are like, uh, if you measured by the perf-based uh, profiler, we, we measured like 40,000 different traces. And if we measure our, by our eBPF-based uh, profiler, we got like 60, 100,000 traces. So imagine that you, have to, you would have to match Every, every, every pair between us, well, there's like a zillion or quadrillion, I don't know, comparisons, which is actually quite hard. And our automatic methods were only able to uh, match like uh, percents of those traces. Yeah, I only say how many we, we detected uh, uh, by, the, by the regression analysis. So we say that there are 1,000 differences between two kernels but those 1,000 differences well, were not matched, so we basically just said, there is some function that is new, and it takes a lot of time. But it could be false positive, because we simply didn't find the corresponding function in the previous kernel, so we, we could not really compare it against anything. Uh, so this is actually quite a nice blend between uh, the academy and the practice, because uh, as I'm a scientist uh, in Seoul, and I used to be also as, 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 as an occupation, uh, I l read a lot of papers, and there is a nice paper that actually solved this. And it's based basically on a Levenstein distance, uh, however adapted to traces. Uh, what it basically does is that you, you want to compute the cost of m changing one trace to another by several operations. If you can match two calls between traces, the cost is zero. If you can add, from one trace to another or remove from one to another, the cost is one. And if you can substitute two calls between traces, uh, it has a variable cost. So 
Uh, for example, here you, we have some functional rebalance domains and run rebalance domains, and they are actually quite similar in naming, so the cost is smaller than, for example, substituting rebalance domain for like load message. Uh, however, uh, this is still a preliminary work because, as I said, there are so many traces and it's really time consuming. So we have to do some preliminary classification, some heuristics and stuff like that that actually I, I have no time to talk about. So, uh, I still have a lot of time, but uh, I'm sh getting slowly to the closing remarks, so I can probably slow down. And I finally got the MMA tape title, so uh, I initially wanted like sea lion standing over corpses of trace monster, pie chart, and uh, kernel <laughs> robot, but that was too complex for current AI. So, um, how could you invite science and academia in your life? Well, my, my first advice is find some friends, and I mean like scientific friends. Uh, I know that a lot of uh, us people from science are kind of mm, unusable in practice, but uh, we are all very, very bright, and we usually have a different view on, on the problem. So find some friends, talk with them, ask what they are doing, tell them what problems you are facing, I'm sure that they will help you out and you can help them becoming better developers as well because uh, while I think I, I'm quite a good developer, I cannot say that uh, about some of my colleagues. Sorry about that. Uh, also, it's good to follow some good scientific conferences. So naturally, we have DEF CONF, PyCONF and stuff like that, but um, on scientific conferences, there are usually different kinds of topics. So I, I've listed three particular ones that I think uh, could be interesting to broad uh, range of people. So for example, the OSDI, PLDI, and Uppsala. Um, I follow them and uh, I've always uh, find uh, one or two papers that I read and they are not so hard for understanding. So you don't, you don't have to come from science to, to read them. And finally, invest properly in your tools. And uh, I mean seriously. Uh, do it properly, even if it's your hobby, hobby project, uh, write test, um, upload it on PIP, do everything you, 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 you want because you never know when some Mark Zuckerberg writes you in an email and wants to buy you. So naturally the question is, are we there yet? Uh, sadly no, but we are close to integration. And was it worth the time? Uh, for me definitely it was really fun and I'm, I'm sad that uh, I would not be able to work on this for, for more time or maybe a lifetime. So in no particular order, I would like to thank a lot of people, especially Red Hat for its support, uh, as well as some uh, projects, mainly the Chess Project and uh, European <laughs> Union. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, you can check out uh, our Perun tool suite. We are on GitHub, we are on PIP, and uh, there is also our Red Hat research site when you can learn about the project as well. And uh, I have shown you some, uh, some pictures. Uh, you can use the QR codes to uh, try them out, try, try them out. There are bugs, trust me, sometimes it fails, but uh, maybe you will be interested in uh, how you can present your data. So again, thank you very much. Okay, any questions? I realize that I, uh, as I'm from Ostrava, I talk really fast, so, um, yes? Yes, uh, the question was whether we have built any uh, tooling or uh, anything that can help pinpoint problems in kernel. Uh, we have built uh, during this, uh, this research like two collectors or profilers in our Perun tool suite uh, that soon will be integ fully integrated in our upstream and uh, we will integrate this into the process of the performance testing that uh, guys in the Red Hat performance team does. So uh, I'm, I'm not completely familiar with the process, but it will basically 
uh, whenever they run a new test, uh, they will run the Perun as well, and then they will generate those images that I've uh, shown. And our uh, feature, future work is actually trying the, the automatic uh, analysis of those profiles that we've collected. So uh, it will take some time uh, before we are able to automatically detect the changes between two kernels because as I said, we need to f first uh, find the good matches. But uh, I think that in f uh, few months or maybe uh, in next uh, half a year, we should be able to have this integrated in the process in the Red Hat. Yes, please. Yes, uh, the question was uh, that uh, the kernel is quite big, so naturally it's, it's, it's uh, hard to start there and we should go lower and lower expectations. So naturally, we, we, as I said, we already have some preliminary uh, experiments even on some kernel data or some uh, more simple uh, benchmarks, but uh, uh, to be honest, there is one particular problem with matching traces that we are not, not really sure what is uh, the good match for the traces. So our current idea is that we probably will create like a new program which will be user driven because I think that it really needs the, the domain of the performance expert who knows what he wants to match. So as, as I said, it's, it's very hard, maybe a philosophical problem. Like what is a good match for a trace? And even in a small, uh, small programs, it, it's hard because sometimes you add some calls, sometimes you rename something and stuff like that. But naturally we, we are starting low, but uh, it's actually fun to you know, jump right into kernel and try to match like 600,000 traces. Some other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I, the, the question was that there are a lot of continuous uh, monitoring, uh, which, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, with the tool called Kicker that is very, very, uh, it actually came from academia as well, and I believe it is used in uh, many firms, and I'm actually interested in creating efficient continuous monitor as well, uh, but I'm, I have not yet found a student who wanted to pursue this, uh, this topic. So yeah, it's, it's actually quite interesting. The other thing is that uh, you usually want to like um, just monitor some, uh, some metrics, for example, using Prometheus and stuff like that. And this is more about, uh, I mean, uh, like real re reliability of, of the systems. But uh, yes, it's interesting and we should support it, but uh, we found no like Oompa Loompa who would work on that. Just, sorry, this is a lighthearted joke. Uh, naturally, the students are very talented and they did a lot of good work, so. I guess that's everything. So again, thank you very much and 